All right, today's passage is from Ephesians chapter 6. It's verses 18 through 20, and it says this. And to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. All right. You, know, you want to know what's a strange thought that kicked into my mind when I was studying this this week? A couple of days ago, um, Amber and I are watching through a show. It's on Hulu. It's called Elementary. I don't know if you've ever heard of the show. It's it was on CBS for seven seasons, and it's kind of a retelling of Sherlock Holmes, uh, only he moved to New York in this scenario, and he's working for the NYPD, or consulting for the NYPD, and it's, it's a pretty cool whodunit show. Um, and the main character, um, in one of the episodes, they're searching for this kidnapped girl. It was the middle of this week, and they came up against this guy, and he had a really thick Italian accent. Um, he was uh, potentially a person of interest, and as Sherlock was explaining, like, this girl was kidnapped, he's like, hey, I heard that she got kidnapped, and you know what? I've been keeping a good thought about her ever since I heard that. And I found that phrase really funny, and I chuckled, and Amber looked at me like I was weird, because that was the first time the phrase good thoughts really was useless to me. I mean, when we think about it, we always have the canned Christian response, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. 50% of that is useless. I mean, keeping a good thought is something that's good emotionally for us, but the very definition of thoughts are things that other people don't know about. I mean, if they could read, if we could read each other's thoughts, I would probably be a much more successful husband. But we're, uh, two of the men in the church got that joke. I like that. <laughs> but we struggle with the translation to thoughts and prayers. You see, prayer matters. Prayer works. Prayer makes an impact. Thoughts are fantastic at being personal. When we keep good thoughts about someone, we may be keeping up a positive repertoire, we may be keeping ourselves being an optimist, but it doesn't impact that other person. Now our actions may, but those aren't thoughts, those are actions. And so I remembered seeing so many people fighting against the phrase, whenever we have a tragedy in our country, people fight against the phrase thoughts and prayers, and they're like, well, those who are skeptical of the gospel are like, well, thoughts and prayers are useless. And other people on the other side are like, look at all those people who don't like God. and They're clearly trying to attack him. And I'm sitting there in the middle being like, all right, 50% 50, 50 of that phrase is really, really important. Prayer. And so I stopped using thoughts and prayers. I only use prayers. I'm sending prayers and lifting you up in prayer. I pray that you, and I make sure that as I do it, I am praying before I do it. Because Prayer is important. Now, when we pray, we don't tell God anything he doesn't already know. We're not changing the course of human history. We're not making God change his mind. But we are participating with God. It's about encouraging us. It's about strengthening us. It's about giving us intentional action. It's about God using us and us committing to following him through whatever situation we pray for. It's about our relationship with God when we pray. It's about turning to him in all things. That is the anchor of prayer. And we see Paul talking about it here as Paul connects and he says in verse 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Now, last week, we went over the armor of God. We broke down the armor of God, every step, what every piece of armor matters. If you guys missed it, if you didn't hear it, if you don't remember it, please go to YouTube. I don't want to keep you guys here until 1 o'clock when the football game starts. So, um, electronic, to go back in there. If you're out on YouTube, please pause the video, go back, watch that one, and come back if you have no idea what the armor of God is. But we spoke on it last week. The anchor of the armor of God that I hope you walked away with the message is our reminding that every element that we need to keep ourselves strong, both in the physical world and the spiritual world, is anchored on what God has already provided for us. 
God gives us the belt. God's truth is our belt. Jesus' righteousness is our breastplate. Jesus offering our salvation is our helmet. God, faith in God is our shield. The word of God, Jesus Christ himself, is our sword. Um, the gospel is our feet. And so all of the armor of God is what God has provided for us, not what we have earned and obtained ourselves. Well, Paul's bringing prayer in here, not as a different thought, not as a different element of the armor of God, but as kind of a maintenance program. Because we can have the greatest armor, armor possible, but if we don't maintenance it regularly, if we don't work and continue our relationship with God appropriately, then the armor will rust. The armor will wear. If we're not constantly seeking God's truth through prayer, then eventually the belt will wear out. If we're not constantly thanking God for the salvation that comes through Christ, then our breastplate starts becoming our own righteousness, and that's filled with holes. That will not work very well. Um, or our helmet of salvation may become dented and weak. And so prayer is incredibly important for us. That's why Paul, most translations have Paul go, and pray in the Spirit, not so pray in the Spirit, or pray in the Spirit. These are not different thoughts. People will try to put a divider here, but Paul's reminding us that prayer is what will anchor everything. When he says pray in the Spirit, that is incredibly important for us to understand because it's praying with the Holy Spirit. We see in John chapter 14, Jesus promises, this, promises us that the Holy Spirit will be with us. He says, And I will ask my Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit participates with us in prayer always. The Holy Spirit's not just here with us until we get on the other side of eternity and then we're free. No, the Holy Spirit is with us always. We'll always be connected to God through the Holy Spirit once we are saved. That is powerful because Paul reminds us as we jump into Romans. That when we don't know what we want, when we don't know how we should pray, when we are praying the wrong things, that the Holy Spirit gets it. And he says uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, he says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Meaning... We don't always have a clue. God does. And if our prayer is us intentionally staying in that relationship, seeking him in all things, turning our judgment over to God's judgment, and that is what our prayer life is, then we won't always know what's going on, but we are always going to be thankful for what God provides us. And so God, and so Paul reminds us back in Ephesians that we should be praying on all kinds of all occasions with all kinds of prayers. We should be praying continually, as Paul teaches us in 1 Thessalonians. Continually doesn't mean when I want to. Continually means continually. You like to have your refrigerator at home working continually, not sporadically, which sometimes our prayer lives can be. If you have a sporadic refrigerator, you will soon have a new refrigerator. Am I right? Because we expect it continually, so we should be praying continually, not just the, the canned prayers. I call them the, the before prayers that Christians typically do, which is before food, before bed. If our prayer life is only before prayer, then we are missing out a lot of our opportunities throughout the day to walk with God closer. And so all kinds of prayers. We should be praying so often just for the glory of God. Have you stopped and prayed, and I won't have you guys raise hands for any of this today, so these are all rhetorical prayers. Have you ever stopped and prayed and said, you know what, I just had to take a moment and thank you for being God. Don't need anything, don't need to thank you for anything, just thank you for being there. We should be praying thanksgiving for everything that God gives us and everything that God doesn't provide for us. 
You see, when we pray thanksgiving for things that God doesn't provide for us, it reminds us that we're not in charge. Think about some of the most important prayers that many of our brothers and sisters in Christ have right now out in the world. They're struggling with income loss. They're probably doing job interviews right now looking for jobs. I'm sure many of you have applied for a job and you prayed really, really, really hard for that job because that job to you meant everything. That this would be more money, this would be a better quality of life, this is what I need, and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed. There's people, there's millions of people in America right now that are doing that very thing. They're seeking God, they're desperately pleading that God will provide for them their, what they want, what they think they want. Not necessarily what they need, because we don't often know what we need. And so they're praying and praying and praying. Now, what if the answer comes back, no? What if they get that phone call of, sorry, you didn't get the job? Well, if you're praying to God to have him give something, you can have two responses. You can have the first one being like, I must have said the prayer wrong. <laughs> like it's a spell. Like, oh, I, I used debts instead of trespasses. Shoot. Of course it didn't work. Maybe they felt like they talked into the wrong microphone. God didn't hear them. It's like, oh, I should have been talking over here, but I didn't. Maybe they feel like God didn't answer, didn't care. When in reality, what they're responding to is what they wanted or they thought they wanted, not necessarily what they needed. I'm sure many of you have examples in your life in which you've prayed for something, it didn't happen, and lo and behold, it turned out that it actually worked out better in the long run, that you didn't get it. Because maybe more money in a job didn't equate more happiness. And so sometimes I look at people who desperately pray for personal things and admittedly selfish things, and I'm just as guilty as anyone else. I've done it all through my life, and I'll probably do it again because I need to lean on the Holy Spirit to actually pray what I need because I don't think everything through, just as you don't think everything through. I, I'm reminded of a Christmas story whenever I think of people praying like that. The, uh, you know, with Ralphie, what's Ralphie's one wish that he wants through the whole story? Red Ryder BB gun, right? Is it a Red Ryder BB gun? I think it is. That's what he wants. He wants this, he wants this, he wants this. And everyone in his life is telling him, no, you shoot your eye out. No, I want it, no. No, mom, dad, shoot your eye out. Teacher, you shoot your eye out. Gave, her, gave him a weak grade on a paper because of the BB gun. I'm like, that's not looking at grammar and structure. I'm not sure why she did that. That's not a great teacher. But just because you disagree with the, like, the elements doesn't mean you grade them less. Sorry. <laughs> That's a sidebar. It was very frustrating. I watched it first when I was a kid, and I had a teacher that did that to me. I'm like, she's grading on content and not on structure. That's not fair. But anyway, so. I'll pray, I'll pray that out of my life in a little while. I'll pray that out of my life. So anyway, like the teacher doesn't give it to him. The, the mall Santa doesn't give it to him. It's just nothing. You shoot your eye out. And you know what? He gets what he wants. After all of it, he gets what he wants. It's under the tree. And what happens? He practically shoots his eye out. Sometimes when we've worked really, really hard for what we want and we keep a zero focus on that, it only brings us pain. Not always. Sometimes we're right in line with what we need. But if we feel like God's not answering us, that's not an element of God not loving us. That's an element of God loving us. Because he's making sure that what we get is what we need. And he has a plan for us that far transcends everything. And so that's a critical prayer for us, is to give God thanks when he doesn't provide what we want. But then we have countless other prayers that Paul highlights. We have prayers of intercession. Praying for people around us who do not know Christ and him crucified, as Paul would say in uh, 1 Corinthians. But we pray for them to know Jesus. That is a critical prayer because instead of not getting a BB gun, that is life with eternity with God or eternity apart from God. That's a big bridge that many of our friends and neighbors need. So intercessory prayer is important. We also have to pray for people we don't like. Now, I said that specifically first because it's a lot easier for us to have a concept of praying for people that don't like us, right? If we're praying for someone who doesn't like us, it's usually along the lines of, please, Lord, let them like me. <laughs> a very selfish prayer, but at least we have our wrap around us. It is very hard for us to pray for people we don't like. 
It's very hard for us to do that. But that's a critical prayer. Christ teaches on that. Pray for those who persecute you. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not what we're supposed to do. Now think about, think about this for a moment. If I walked into the average conservative Christian church this Sunday, somewhere else, say down south, and I asked them a show of hands, hey, how many of you are praying for President Trump this morning? Every hand would go up. We'd probably have two, three shoulder dislocations. It'd be ridiculous. Their hands would fly up. Of course I'm praying for Donald Trump. He's our president. He's our leader. I'm praying for everything. And then if I followed up and said, all right, for the previous eight years, how many of you prayed for Barack Obama every morning? I bet a lot of hands would go down. And you know what? The hands that stayed up, probably people lying. Or worse, they're like, yeah, I prayed for Barack Obama. I prayed that he figured out exactly what I wanted him to do. I prayed for him to change his mind. I prayed every morning that he'd wake up and he'd hug an elephant and run away. That's what they're praying for. I don't know why I some, somehow made them Texans. I didn't think I was going to go that south, but. We do that a lot. And I bring this up now, not because I want to be controversial, but because this is a prime opportunity for you guys to stretch your legs with this stuff. Because I don't know where each one of you lean politically, but there's probably a candidate that you agree with and there's a candidate that you disagree with. And if you're praying for both of them as you should as Christians, because at the end of the day, they're both beloved children of God, whether they recognize it or not. They're both beloved children of God and they need prayer. If you're praying for one of them versus the other, are you praying for the one you agree with differently than the one you disagree with? The one that you agree with, are you praying that the enemies start beating down their door without even stopping to pause to think that those enemies you're talking about are brothers and sisters in Christ in America who are you labeling as enemies? Or are you praying on the other side for the other candidate to be like, Lord, let them see things the way I want them. Let, them. let them think the way I want them to think. Let them vote the way I want them to vote. Is that how we pray in politics right now? The answer is yes. But is that how we should pray in politics right now? No. Every morning I try to wake up and I try to pray good health for Joe Biden and Donald Trump. That they experience God in their day and that God's will works through them. And the reason my prayer is that, and I, I don't want to say every morning because some mornings I get tired and I... It takes a while before I pray, but when I make that prayer, I do it intentionally because I don't want to try to shape the world based on what Brad thinks is right and wrong. I want to shape the world in what God thinks is right and wrong. And I don't know the mind of God very much beyond the words in Scripture. I do know that revelation's coming. I do know that God's will will be acted out. And I know that on November 4th or 5th or whatever day or they figure out who actually won the election, I know that that will be part of God's plan. That nobody is going to somehow defeat God because the wrong person got elected one way or another. That God will reign in spite of potentially whichever one is in the White House. In reality, probably in spite of both of them. That's how God works. God will not be stopped. His kingdom is coming whether Americans want to get on board or not. And so when we pray for the goodness of other people, we're not only saying that we pray for them because we want them to change, but because we need God to be present. We need God to be in this world. I have seen too much of this fallen, broken state of creation, and I know those of you who are much older than me have seen too much more, and I am so sick of it. I pray daily for Christ to come back because I am finished. But God isn't, and that's apparent 
Because he's not back yet. I should say Jesus isn't back yet. God is present everywhere. But we're still waiting on the second coming. And until then, there's work to be done. And so our prayer should be focusing on the work, not on political squabbles. And I bring that up in our prayer lives because our prayer lives are what gets our armor strong. It's what gets our armor prepared. It's what's going to get us through the next six weeks. I'm already tired of looking at political ads. I'm already tired of seeing my friends on Facebook insult each other and ridicule each other and harass each other. I'm tired of it all. But it's giving me a lot of reasons to pray. To pray that their hearts may be at peace, to pray that their health is there, to pray that above all, they don't find the person they want to vote for, they find the Christ that should be determining how they want to live. And so we see Paul reminding us towards the end of this. He says, pray also for me whenever I speak. Words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I declare it fearlessly as I should. Paul's pleading for prayer. It is important for our spiritual leaders to have prayer. I need prayer constantly. Craig Ripatella at Centerpoint Church needs prayer. Mike Alec, Mike Alex at Blessed Hope needs prayer. Justin Frank at Penny Memorial needs prayer. Spiritual leaders need prayer. Our missionaries need prayer. It encourages us. It strengthens us. It polishes our armor. Paul's pleading this. And notice the thing that a lot of people, I think, miss about Paul's prayer. Paul is praying that he could have wisdom to share the gospel for others. It's Paul's prayer, right? Give me the wisdom that I'm not misrepresenting Christ to this world. What prayer Paul's not praying is deliverance from his current situation. He tells us right here that he is an ambassador in chains. Paul is in prison when he writes Ephesians. All of Ephesians was written from his jail cell. He's not asking for salvation from his current trials. He's asking for wisdom that he may follow and work for Christ better. That's a prayerful heart and a half that we should desire. That we pray for thanksgivings for all that we've had and for what we missed, but we pray just as feverishly that those around us can see Christ because of who we are, because of what we do. And that's why we sum up our study and Ephesians, our, us going through Ephesians, with that note. We have wrestled with Ephesians for seven months and two weeks. Do you know how I know that? Because I recorded the first message two weeks before Maine was first locked down for coronavirus. So we've been wrestling with this for seven months, in case you guys were wondering. It both feels like 10 days and 10 years to me. It's depending on how I perceive it. But those people who take Ephesians chapter 2 when they highlight the main passage for it is grace by God that you are saved and not by your own doing so no one should boast. Those who look at that and say to themselves, you know what? I guess I really don't have to do much because God does all the saving, right? It's the mindset that you'll hear some people indirectly say, God does the saving, I'll handle the sinning. And they look at Paul and they say, well, Paul doesn't want us to work because he just told us that we can't earn our salvation. Well, that's strange because as we've wrestled with Ephesians for the last few months, we've been working in chapters four, five, and six, which is all about how Paul is telling us that we should be working. It's a beautiful thing about Ephesians. He spends the first three chapters, as you've heard me say for countless weeks now, focusing on who God is and what God has done. God the Father has predestined us for adoption into his family. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. God the Son, Jesus Christ, has saved us and given us a path to eternity with God, with the cross and the resurrection. And God the Holy Spirit seals us into that promise of salvation and eternity by sanctifying our hearts, by continually moving us every day with our own work towards Christ. He's either challenging us every day of us slipping away or he's 
celebrating with us as we move closer to Christ. Every day, God is doing that to us. That is our salvation. The Father put a plan to save us in action. The Son <laughs> saved us on the cross. And the Holy Spirit saves us in our lives. Paul has laid that out. And then Paul spent the last four chapters basically saying, listen, because of everything God has done, you're not people anymore. You're not Tim. You are a new creation. You are like Jesus. So act like Jesus. He talks about how we should react to each other as a church. How we should react to other people individually in our relationships. He spoke about how we should, how we should define our roles in marriage and our roles in our working relationships. He's highlighted so much of how we should be and how we should change because of all the stuff that God did. And that's our Ephesians study. Next week, we're wrestling with James and we're intentionally moving into the book of James because a lot of people think James contradicts Paul. James focuses, the core passage that most people remember from James is faith without works is dead. And then they see Paul saying, you can't earn it. It's only faith. And they say, oh, those two people disagree. They don't. They perfectly agree, which we're going to find out over the next several weeks. But that's what we're moving into. So we need to anchor everything. We need to end how we began in prayer. Because how we pray will directly define our impact we have in our community and our impact we'll have in the world. And I promise you, the next couple of weeks will be the hardest prayer time you will probably go through. The world is so going to push you to hate your neighbor. The world is going to push you to hate a candidate in the Senate, in the House, or even on the school board. The world wants you to hate one person and love another so that you both experience the sin of hating people and you idolatrize, idolatize your love away from God. And it's going to happen in spades and in spades and in spades. And we're going to be up here praying for our nation and praying for our friends and praying for other people every day. But I need you guys to walk out of here today and continue to pray. I need you the next time you hear a political ad on the radio, stop and say, you know what, Lord, I pray Susan Collins has a blessed day or I pray Sarah Gideon has a blessed day and that, Lord, you are with them and you keep them safe and protected as they're speaking to people. We need those prayers out of our mouths often. That's how we're going to get through the next six weeks. If we're not doing that, we're going to look so much like the world that the world, that God will have no use for us. And so yeah, we're, we're ending Ephesians. Be a new creation. Have intentional actions to follow God and don't just go with the wind. All right, and now I want to give you homework. I haven't given you guys homework for a while. What I want you guys to do this week is I want you to read James. It's not huge. It's five chapters. It'll take you 20 minutes to read it in one setting. It'll take you five days worth of four-minute moments to read it otherwise. I don't want you to dig into it to study or to think. I want you to pray on it and read on it so that when we begin next week, you have a foundation into what we're talking about. Commit to God 20 minutes this week to read the Bible. And I know many of you spend a lot more time than that, but if you haven't and you struggle with it, 20 minutes. And if you still struggle with it and we get to Wednesday, call me. I'll find a time to sit down with you and read it specifically with you. We'll get through it. But be in the Word this week. Let us pray. Lord, let prayer never cease from our lips. Let us always recognize how amazing you are. Lord, let us always understand how broken we are. Lord, I pray that you are with us as we wrestle the next several weeks and then the months and years beyond, Lord, I pray you continue to be with us. I pray that you are with each other and that you are with our brothers and our sisters who are struggling right now with where they want the world to pull them to. And I pray 
that you let us see everyone, whether political candidate or lady in the grocery store, is a beloved child of God who needs you. And that you give us the courage and strength to not only pray, but act on that prayer if you move us to. Lord, be with our community, be with this church, and be with this body. Let us not be useless, Lord, but let us be bold in proclaiming you as Lord. Watch over us. For we ask this in your name. Amen. All right, let us open our hymnals now to Sweet Hour of Prayer. It's number 444. Lord, be with us as we go out into this world. Let us be convicted by the Holy Spirit and improve every day as we commit to be disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ. Let us follow him as we proclaim him as Lord, and let us always keep our eyes on the horizon for his second coming, Lord. Be with us every moment of the day, for we ask this in your name. Amen.